This is Giving the Game Away, the podcast where we explore the journeys of elite athletes and uncover lesser spoken about topics from the world of sport. And coming up on today's episode. Once one person started shouting, Rune, Rune, and then a small section started saying it, and then the whole stadium just starts going, Rune, Rune. I shout myself. Like, I had no control of that emotion. I'd never, ever felt anything like it. We ended up in Usain Bolt's party, and this VIP section that he had was rammed, right? Like, hugely rammed. Then, then Bolt, he's like on the other side of the, the booth kind of thing, and it's literally probably about three meters across. And all he says is he starts wading across. And he's like, really? <laughs> and we're just chatting. And that was a cool moment to have, like, over a lot of drink. To be on the podium there was, um, it, it was a magical feeling. Like, um, my wife had actually given birth maybe three days before that. So I had to come back with a medal. You know, I couldn't, like, miss my son's birth and then come home empty-handed. So uh, we had to run hard to get it. Martin Rooney is who we are hearing from today, a double 400 metre European champion, former captain of Team GB, and someone who's managed to maintain a position at the top of their sport for over 10 years now. He's been to three Olympic Games and he's had pretty unique experiences at each one with doping and with disqualification, so I'm really interested to hear about those experiences today. He's got his own podcast as well, called That Greaves and Rooney Sports Podcast, where he's really open about life as an athlete. I'm looking forward to more of that honesty over the course of the next hour. When we spoke to Emily Diamond a few weeks ago, I've really enjoyed hearing about her Olympic experiences and learning all about what comes with an Olympic Games. And that's something I'm looking forward to delving into today because not many people can say they've appeared at three Olympic Games, but Martin Rooney can. And as Joel says, he has some unique experiences from each of them. He got a bronze at Beijing 2008, eight years after racing, when it was later found out that a member of the Russian relay team had been doping. He then went to home games in 2012 in London and had quite a tough time due to the immense pressure of a home crowd. And then at Rio 2016, he arrived as part of the Team GB relay team who were one of the favourites, but unfortunately were disqualified in controversial circumstances. They're all really interesting experiences that I'm looking forward to delving into today. And yeah, what Joel says about his honesty is so true. I listen to his podcast and he's always struck me as a really honest athlete who's not afraid of saying his opinion, even if it's sometimes a little bit controversial. And that makes him for a really interesting interview. He's just a really open guy and one of Team GB's biggest characters. It'll be great to hear about his insights on all things athletics from both on and off the track. Thanks for coming on, Martin. We recently had your Team GB teammate, uh, Emily Diamond, on and we really enjoyed hearing about her mindset as an Olympian. So it'll be really good to hear your insights too. You've been to three Olympic Games yourself, which is a lot more than most people can say. So we're looking forward to delving into those three experiences and all the highs and lows in between. But if we actually take it right back to the beginning, how did you actually get into 400 meter running? Because I think you started off doing longer distances, didn't you? Um, yeah, so I came from a multi-sport background. I played rugby, I played football, cricket. Uh, I did af- athletics and I did everything in athletics. Um, Obviously, I was a lot better at endurance than I was at jumping, but I did, I tried everything. And um, yeah, I, I was a good county standard endurance, like 800, 1500 guy, go to English schools, national level, but never never go into that next bit. And um, I just kind of stumbled upon the 400. I, after doing 800s and cross country, one lap is easy. <laughs> and uh, so I just kind of, once I found that I was, I found it quite easy and I was quite good at it, uh, I just decided to stick with it. And um yeah, it's been a long time that I've been doing it now. Yeah, nice. And you were part of Croydon Harriers, weren't you, growing up? It's obviously quite a like well-established athletics club. How important do you think that was when you were coming through? I was very lucky to be at the club. I think uh, Croydon is a hotbed of sporting talent. I think uh, you get a, a big mix of like um, lower income and higher income families and stuff. And so some with massive opportunities. And athletics is kind of a good leveller. So um, for me, it was brilliant. Like I was kind of going there and there was kids from my private schools that I was training with and competing with and they'd have all the nice kit and stuff. And But your mentality was I wanted to beat the kids with a good kit. Um, and I had a coach who basically just like made everything fun. He was a bit weird, like still a bit weird. Yeah, he like has a megaphone and he's barking through the megaphone. But as a young kid, that was just kind of fun. And you were like, um, it definitely kept me in the sport and I think that's what happens if you don't go to the right place and don't get into the right club you, you're not held in the sport long enough and 
you don't get the chance to flourish. Yeah, and it seemed to work well because you rose through the ranks pretty quickly. And I'd say it seems like your, your breakthrough was probably uh, in a, around 2005, you uh, were asked to fill in for the, the men's senior team for the 4x400 relay. Mm. And you were actually originally only doing the heat, but because you performed so well, they ended up asking you to compete again in the, in the final. So that shows that you were able to sort of seize those big moments and you th- did and burst into the scene in that high pressurized moment. Yeah, I think um, from from being a kid and uh, from my parents and from the school I went to, like we always encouraged to take the opportunities we're given, uh, whatever it might be. And uh, I, that season, 2005, I'd been to the European Junior Championships. Uh, I came second there and then the relay we won. And basically I got recommended off of how I'd ran in the relay there uh, to go to the Senior World Champs. And... I just took it like I was like, this is just fun. I'm, I was meant to be going to Malia with my mates, um, but I ended up going to Helsinki for the World Champs, and it was uh, it was an amazing experience. And yeah, I ran well. I was it was just one of those things of I didn't go out there to to make the final. I just took every race for me. Every every time I hit the track, it was just a massive opportunity to prove myself. And um, yeah, I was fortunate. I, I, I ran well and managed to get another run out. Unfortunately, we came fourth in a time that was. Uh, I think it won medals at every Olympics before that. Uh, so it was a tough one to swallow. But for me, everything was just a bonus. It was just amazing to be there um, and to race against your idols and be surrounded in teams with people that I'd watched on TV. It was, it was, it was a crazy and an amazing experience. Mm. And because that, you had people like Steve Cram obviously speak quite openly about your talent. Do you feel, did you feel uh, any pressure because of that at all or any expectation was put on you? Um, yeah, there was bit of pressure and expectation I suppose when Steve Cram starts touting you as the next Seb Co or something like that um, but I was never uh, like we were for- fortunate there was no social media really back then this is a long time ago guys like um, Facebook was kind of very very new and in its infancy and to be honest it wasn't even in the UK at that stage so the pressure was still very much a little bit from the press and a little bit from the athletics world but it wasn't any bigger than that and um, I was very lucky I went to a group where from there I moved to Loughborough and um, I was in a group of athletes who were just world-class athletes so you're surrounded by those kind of guys that this is the the norm this is the level that you have to reach and uh, it just became I didn't really overthink it then I think uh, my coach was used to dealing with world-class athletes and he kind of put me in my place quite quickly so it was good. I think sometimes that's the benefit of being young as an athlete is you have that naivety sometimes and you, you don't actually overthink stuff too much and that seemed to work for you well and you managed to deal with the pressure well but also you then went to the Beijing Olympics shortly after mm-hmm. which is obviously the biggest stage in athletics did you feel any pressure then when you were finally on that big stage oh yeah the, the Olympics is all I ever dreamed of as soon as I became an athlete um, I think I was very fortunate one of my club members uh, there's a woman called Donna Fraser she came fourth in the Sydney Olympics in the 400 um, and she grew up literally the road behind where I grew up um, she she showed that going to the Olympics was possible for someone from my area and then um, yes yeah, so to go to an Olympic Games it was massive pressure but when you run well things kind of everything seems a bit easier like I was in good shape I I went into the Olympics unbeaten and I had run at sub 45 for the first time and I was comfortably in that like in a groove so it was just a ride it was a really cool thing to do as a 21 year old and um, I was disappointed not picking up a medal but my, my aim was to go to the Olympics as a kid and then all I thought about was trying to make the Olympic final that for the for 10 11 months building into the Olympics so achieving those two goals was amazing um, with a bit of hindsight I should have looked aimed higher but uh, yeah it was uh, a great not a learning curve because if you're ready, you're ready. You don't need to hang about. Like you see people like Mbappe, who's like one of the greatest players ever already. You know, he's only a kid. So um, yeah, it, it was definitely something that I, I thrived upon and I, I, I puked my guts up before every race, but I loved it. And aside from the actual running itself, what was it like being a part of the Olympic Village and taking all that in at just 21? Is there stuff that you can sort of lift the lid on that happens in the Olympic Village that many people might not even hear about? Um, I think everyone talks about there's lots of sex. I did, I missed out on all that. I don't know. Like I was gutted about that, but uh, no, I wasn't. My my, my partner now wife uh, was on the team as well, uh, and we uh, had a great time. Um, <laughs> but 
the the Olympic Village was weird, like because it was all set up as a it was going to be an estate, um, like high rise buildings with penthouse suites and stuff. So the room that we had was kind of weird set up. Like the window for the there's a window for the toilet right next to my bed. So if someone went to the toilet in the night, it was like literally I, I had like a piece of paper and stuff trying to block it out, but I could hear everything. It was it was weird. So it was just like you kind of in temporary accommodation. Um, but it's still an amazing thing. Like it's just buzzing. Like the weather was perfect. Uh, we had the Brazil volleyball team, female team behind us and stuff. So that was always exciting. Uh, the food was really good. Um, yeah, it was just like, I, I was lucky those kids, my age or kids, those guys, like maybe within my age range at 24, my roommate was like 24 and we were just on cloud nine. We were both running well and, um, it was an amazing experience to be a part of and just an amazing thing to kind of learn how to be out of games as well. Like that nervous energy uh, that people have and they can really mess up the competition. We didn't have it because I think we just took it, took it in our stride. We just enjoyed the moment rather than overthinking it. Yeah, we've talked to Olympians before who have spoken about how overwhelming the whole Olympic experience is with everything that comes along with the games. But it sounds like you just took it in your stride. Yeah, even things like walking around the Olympic Village and seeing the biggest stars in sport, people like Usain Bolt and Michael Phelps, it must have been incredible being a part of that whole village experience. Yeah, I, I saw Ronaldinho um, walking through the village once and he was like, literally, there was a scrum of footballers around him, so the young under-21 guys, who were probably like superstars later on, but they were kind of protecting him. Uh, and that was pretty like, oh, it's Ronaldinho. Like, um and at that age, at 21, those things really do like resonate with you. Like I think um, Bolt to me was always like I'd kind of been through the age groups with Bolt, so I, I didn't really I knew he was a superstar, but I didn't really see him like that um, at that stage. And then uh, Michael Phelps, uh, but just to be in that experience as a as a 21 year old, uh, it definitely helped with my development as an athlete. You narrowly missed out on that medal in 2008, which must have been incredibly gutting at the time. But it came out later in 2016 that the Russians were doping and therefore that the bronze was yours. How did it feel achieving something so amazing and something that you'll have for life, but ultimately it's something that you knew you should have had eight years earlier? Um, I think on the day we knew like there's a Russian team that we'd beaten early in the summer by like, four seconds. Um, and then all of a sudden they're Olympic medalists running a time that yeah, it was ridiculously fast. We ran, we came fourth in a time that should have easily like come second, really. To not come second or third in that time was it was obscene. So um, yeah, we knew at the time. Uh, not, and it's a really negative place to be. And I kind of carried that for a long time. I think the feeling of uh, you get on, you go back to the village, you've come fourth, you're a disappointment. When you go, uh, when you go back on the flight, like all the medalists get upgraded or get nice seats or whatever. And you're just there like head down, like you just feel shit if I'm perfectly honest. Um, and it kind of, you carried on. To, I held on to it for a long time. And then I learned, so like I had to let go of it like a couple of years. Um, and you talk to international athletes and we were like, nah, it's never, you're never going to get that medal. We know you, you came third, but you're never going to get that. So when it did come, it was like, wow. Like uh, for me, it was like uh, more for my teammates than for me myself because I'd been very fortunate I'd gone to other championships I'd won a medal I'd gone back to Beijing and won a medal there so I'd had my moment on the podium in the bird's nest and I was like cool that's it I'm, I'm free from it all uh, whereas the rest of the guys like a lot of them had got injured or retired after that and yeah they kind of like uh, for them to be to get that recognition and to get that moment back it was huge and I I, I really we, they did a great job for us. They really looked after us. They put on a, a uh, they put on the medal presentation during the Diamond League in London, and um, yeah, we got our medals from Seb Co. and we got the national anthem, which was kind of weird for third place, but it was an amazing thing to happen. And I was lucky; I had my whole family there. My my son was only like a year old, but he was there, and he they all got treated. They were all up in VIP with the prawn sandwich brigade, <laughs> loving life. Um, so it, it was, uh, we were very fortunate to get it. And uh, I think I'm due a couple more medals soon, but we'll see. Yeah, let's hope so. Um, but yeah, no, it was great that you ended up getting that bronze medal that you deserved eventually. Um, although it's probably not quite the same receiving it so long after the actual event. 
Um, but there were also other things that those Russians who uh, were cheating took away from you. It wasn't just that moment on the podium that they took away, but also financial opportunities, uh, media opportunities. So there's so much that comes with being a, a medalist that they took away from you. So it must have been pretty tough to take. Well, yeah, like if I'd come, I lost my car. So I had an Alfa Romeo, which was a lovely little car, a little GT that was, as a 21-year-old, amazing. And it was part of like the British Athletics scheme. Like if you won medals, you got these cars. So I'd got a World Junior medal, I got the car. But I had to give it back because I didn't get an Olympic medal. And I was gutted. Uh, so little things like that, like having a free car uh, for another four years or something, that would have been amazing. Uh, going into a home games as an Olympic medalist, was it was it was a golden ticket, really. Like it didn't matter what medal you had, as long as you had it. We saw athletes from the 96 Olympics, 2000 Olympics, way back who had medals and they were like constantly doing marketing st- campaigns and adverts and whatever. And it was, that's the kind of stuff that we missed out on. Those little appearances where it's a couple of grand in appearance, it's, it pays towards deposit on a house or whatever, you know? And that's, um, that's the thing. I think that did hurt. Um, but it's just like I said, I had to kind of get over it. If I if kept <laughs> stayed in that negative place, um, yeah, I don't think my wife would have would have stayed with me and I don't think I'd have been able to carry on with my career. You're saying as well that you knew um, that the Russians were doing what they were doing just by based on, just based on times. And there mm. were obviously sp- suspicions, but was it something that was talked about a lot? Were people saying to each other, oh, there's something up here? Yeah, I think uh, I, uh, I kicked off in anti-doping. Um, so I only... So the whole of the American team that won, they were tested, so four guys... And then the one Bohemian who came second on last leg, one Russian who, came, who was last leg, and then me. And I was like, well, no, the, you need to test the whole Russian team. And I said it openly in there, and obviously it doesn't make you very popular when you say stuff like that, and you've just come fourth because everyone, and then everyone basically tells you piss off. But um, none of the guys were quali- had qualified, in, uh, one guy had qualified individually for the Olympic Games. So like, for them to run the time that they had, they should have been all like 44 second runners. So then none of the, there's only one guy who was a 45 second runner. So it was really obvious. Um, and I, I don't actually blame the athletes. I never have. I've always felt like they're just doing what they're told. It's, it's the system that they're in. Um, so I, I never really blamed them. It was just like the system that they were part of that kind of uh, we all knew was corrupt. There's whispers about it. Yeah, it, it was a shame. Like you kind of, you can be bitter about it and hold on to it for a long time. And like I did, like, too long, definitely too long. But once you get over it, you're kind of free from it and you kind of get to enjoy the rest of your career. Yeah, and I guess with athletics, you, you do have to move on because the next event just comes around so quickly. And like before long, it was London 2012, the home Olympics. Mm. That must have been crazy to be a part of that. Yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone really prepared us for that. I don't think I did. I, I, uh, physically, I did. I got myself into great shape. Um, and But mentally, going to that Games, it was just... No one's ever like. I, I wish I'd have been able to speak to someone like Wayne Rooney or David Beckham or someone like that. Just someone who's used to having their name chanted by eighty thousand people. Like um, I, I, I went there at probably about eighty percent. I was I picked up a fairly serious hip injury in the middle of the summer, but you can't miss the home games, so you carry on. And I kind of managed. I, I kind of could have scraped through to the final, the shape I was in. Um, but my semi final when. Uh, once one person started shouting Rune, Rune, and then a small section started saying it, and then the whole stadium just starts going Rune, Rune. I shout myself like I had no control of that emotion. I'd never ever felt anything like it, and I went from basic very confident and like, oh, I'm going to go run well, to oh, just don't full start, just don't full start, and uh, so it was very tough. Like it was an amazing thing to happen. Uh, I've been for- very fortunate to go to two other home games. Uh, championships but to have a home Olympics and uh, yeah to be able to go out there and perform in front of those people it's a privilege Mm, definitely and was it that feeling of being in a home games and it being quite overwhelming was that something that you feel a lot of athletes felt as well yeah I wouldn't say I was on my own with that I feel like um, a lot of athletes would have gone there and some people thrived on it some people really outperformed themselves but other people really they went there and it, there were some opportunities that were missed. Uh, I don't think I was the only one who can who came away feeling that way. Um, but it's it's hard to say. Like some people just rise to, rise to the occasion. Uh, a lot of the international guys, when it, they loved having a British athlete in their race because they knew when they got out there, there was going to be noise, like real massive, like 80,000 people screaming. 
and they thrived on it. And I, I, I love it when I've, if I go to Brussels and I'm racing against the, the Borlay brothers, the crowd goes mad. And I'm like, yes, listen. And I can see their face going, oh, this is different. This is a hard feeling. But like, I thrive on it. But when it was for you and it's literally on you, it's, it's um, at that stage of my career, I wasn't ready for it. I was obviously 2017. Uh, I thrived on it a bit in the relay. But uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a different feeling at 2012. Yeah, it's a, that's a crazy insight because I think you assume as a fan that if you're chanting for an athlete that's going to boost their performance but actually you're saying it hinders it that, that's like really fascinating to hear i think i think if i was prepared for it then i'd have been pumped i'd have been this is it this is this is my house it's my stadium but at that stage of my career now i just i just didn't know how to handle it and uh like i said if i spoke to wayne rooney he gets it every time he scores you know like he goes to old Trafford, seventy thousand people shouting his name it's kind of like normal for him and uh, i could have maybe had some tech tactics or techniques of how to block it out or how to just use it to my advantage and um yeah so it was, it was a shame like it was it's a it was a great occasion just to be part of to have family friends there and um people that you just from your area people that you, you knew growing up just being there somehow getting tickets wherever it took you know that was pretty cool mm. And then obviously after the Olympics, there's, you're going to have to deal with it mentally maybe a few weeks after. But what was the initial sort of blowout like after the Olympics? I've heard you speak on your podcast about, you know, being out with people like Usain Bolt and stuff like that. Yeah, I got smashed. I did two days on the trot. It was brilliant. Um, and it's nice because like you go to London and like uh, you find out going out in London, it's just expensive. But when you were part, of, you had your games pass. It seemed to be a lot cheaper. <laughs> you got a lot of free drinks, and um, you go to the most exclusive clubs in London, and you're just there. It's like it was cool. Like I, we went to uh, one night. I went out. It was um, <laughs> we ended up in Usain Bolt's party, and this VIP section that he had was rammed. Right, like hugely rammed. Too many people in it. Uh, so I stayed on the outside of it, and uh, then like. Uh, Bolt's manager calls me in. I, I'd known him, Ricky, for a long time. He calls me over and he gets me a drink or whatever. And then, then Bolt, he's like on the other side of the, the booth kind of thing. And it's literally probably about three meters across. And all he says, he starts wading across. And he's like, really? <laughs> and we're just chatting. But then the best thing about it is we're talking about Radisha. We're talking about Dave Radisha. Like he's the greatest Olympian ever, Usain Bolt, like double, triple gold champion. And he's talking about Radisha and how amazing his run was. And I was like, oh, you're just a fan. You're just a dude. Like, I, I, do, I don't know. It just made me realise like, how much he loved the sport. And that was a cool moment to have, like, over a lot of drink. But, <laughs> yeah, it was cool. Yeah, that must be a really special moment. Because I guess as an athlete, you are so constantly focusing on being really uh, strict with your diet and your training. And very rarely do you get a chance to sort of let your hair down and, and have drinks. So to be able to do that with the likes of Usain Bolt must just be a great celebration after a, a good home games. Yeah, it was cool. I think uh, that my favourite moment was like when I got back to the village and uh, it was sun was coming up and I think it was our hockey team of like Dutch girls. I'm there trying to take this picture of this statue or whatever and I end up on my back like literally <laughs> like you know like how a beetle would fall back or something and my legs are just in the air. <laughs> the whole team's walking past me like this drunk idiot but it was um yeah you let your hair down I, i've always encouraged athletes obviously if you've got races i had races afterwards as well but um you have to there's so much stress that goes into it so much emotion so much uh pressure that comes with a champ any championships that you have to kind of let your hair, that hair down and uh be that whatever vice that is um something safe like chocolate would probably be the best thing but yeah alcohol seems to be the, the favorite for most people i think that's the side of athletics that's not portrayed that much because like cam said it's like a massive focus on having such a strict diet and you're such finely tuned athletes but you know you saying stories like that and stuff like on your podcast it does show a completely different side to athletics i think yeah i think on the podcast myself and dan um we uh we've both come at it from a quite a balanced we're both very focused athletes so he's won every paralympic medal he can win um and he's I think he, we both understand like well, how important it is just to like let yourself go, let yourself relax, let yourself kind of that pent up stress and all that thing. It's it's not it's not healthy. Um, so you have to kind of let your hair down. And um, because we don't drink regularly, it doesn't really take much either. To be honest, it's a couple of drinks and most people are gone. Um, so uh, most athletes are done in. So it's a yeah, it's still a cheap night. 
Yeah, I, I think that's what's great about your podcast is it gives an insight into athletes that you don't regularly get to hear. Like, I mean, as a fan or as a spectator, all you ever see of a, an athlete is really a, a 30 second post race interview when they just run a 400 meter race and they're out of breath and like don't have time to really think about what's going on. So like to be able to sit them down for an hour and have a conversation about their career, it gives a really nice insight that you don't mm. always get. Thank you very much. I think, yeah, it's kind of all the long form media thing where you just kind of get to chat to people and have a, a normal conversation rather than like if I come off the track and I've got my glasses on and sweating and people just don't know my face. They literally know the glasses and that's it and a beard. So like when I do get to chat on a pod or whatever, it's always a bit more like, oh, this is nice. And I think um, there's, there's so many ways now that athletes can interact in a positive way rather than and sell not sell themselves in a way that's like negative. I mean, just sell like, just to get people to support them. Like you want people to be able to go, oh, I like Emily. Like you had Emily on your pod as well. And like, I like listening to what she had to say. Now I'm going to follow her career. And hopefully that means like she gets more publicity. And whatever. And I think that's what um, we're trying to do. It's just make sure like kind of speak to athletes who have good stories and have a lot to share. And then hopefully they've got a good bit of character, good laugh to be around. So I think that's what podcast offers a lot of people. Mm, I think that's right. And I think, so I was scrolling your Instagram before doing this interview now and we were, you, I saw you say that like during COVID you were getting a bit sick of basically seeing on TV all these montages of athletics events and stuff. And I think <laughs> things like the podcast will get people into the sport a bit more because it just shows a different side to it. Yeah, I think uh, in athletics we've got... A, um, there seems to be... We have a couple of stars who are brilliant. Like they're fantastic athletes. You've got uh, your Dean Rasher-Smith, KJT. You've got... Um, Laura Muir, um, Mo Farah. But then like what the BBC will always do is show videos of Colin Jackson in 1990, whatever, or uh, Steve Backley throwing. And like, I don't really think that they want to show off themselves anymore. You know, I think they kind of like passed it. I know like people like you and Thomas would be like, he gets sick of it. He's just like, all right, just let's just show these current crop and try and promote them and bring them up. Um, so like that time, like I think with the podcast, you kind of get to speak to more athletes and, get to hear more of their story rather than the same ones that are always thrown at you every time and those guys have earned everything they they work hard they train hard they they can perform at the top level so they earn the right to be the focal point of the sport but i think then we forget that we do a sport with i think it's like 20 like, how many events is there there's a lot of events <laughs> there's a lot of people that you can publicize you know a lot of people you can work with and um yeah i think that's where podcasts have really come into it If we go back to your career, so you had the 2012 Olympics, which we just touched on. Uh, another big event that came shortly after was the World Championships in 2015. Um, mm -hmm. w went back to Beijing and, and got the bronze finally on, on top of the podium. Did that feel a little bit uh, like closure for you? Yeah, 100%. To be on the podium there was, um, it, it was a magical feeling. Like um, my wife had actually given birth uh, to maybe three days before then and uh, so I had to come back with a medal you know I couldn't like miss my son's birth and then come home empty-handed so uh, we had to run hard to get it um, but to come away from there with the uh, the bronze medal um, yeah it was cool and it was with people I like you know like I was in the team of like even the guys on the podium and other teams I got on with pretty much all of them you know like it was kind of like we raced a lot but we kept we're cool and we got to celebrate that moment as a as three different squads and enjoy ourselves and um actually there's quite a lot of whiskey there as well uh, <laughs> um we uh yeah we we had uh, little coke bottles of whiskey that was a good a good <laughs> good party but just to go back to the feeling of closure from 2008 it was just something massive for me to be able to go i could look up at this amazing stadium and i had what i'd come here for in 2008 i'd come away with the medal that we don't then and re-earned in another way like um and uh my parents were there unfortunately my wife wasn't there and obviously she was busy <laughs> but um yeah it was an amazing thing and uh i was like i was very fortunate i was team captain on that trip uh for the whole gb team and um i got to close the stadium with this big flag passing the flag on to uh from beijing to london and uh yeah, it was just cool. It kind of felt like I'd had my 
I'd had that moment. I got to enjoy it and yeah, it was in good form. I was going to say about you being captain of the team because obviously it must have been such a proud moment, but also it's it must be quite different to captaining a team in football or in rugby or something because there's so many people across so many different events. You're not mm. all doing it at the same time. How, how different is it really and what does it feel like? It's huge. In team sports, it's, your focal point is your captain. It's the guy that you respect. It's the, or the guy who kind of drives you on and keeps you honest. So I kind of looked at it as my role of like, look, there's Jess Ennis on the team. There's people like that who are like up here. Mo Farrell's on the team. I'm just, I'm just another athlete. But if I can just do the best that I can, I just try and kind of set some rules out like for to the athletes to understand like this is business. Um, it's not here to to have you. Ha you can enjoy yourself, but make sure you're here to perform at the top of your bit level. No excuses. Go on that track and give everything you've got, and um, try to be a good teammate. Try not to mess up anybody else's championships. If you finish early, don't be a dickhead. Um, and that was pretty much my thing. It was quite simple. Um, and then my role was to go and perform to my best of my ability. And I, in the heats, I ran a PB. I didn't make the final, but I think I kind of was done in from my heat run. Um, but it was uh, it was just to go out there and prove, like, this is an opportunity that you should take. So I had to go and sh show them, show everybody on the team that I was ready to do that. And... Um, I think we had it. We were the most successful British team ever for medal hall and finalists and stuff. So it was a good championships. I, I think the guys really performed well. I'd love to say it was all down to my team speech, but I don't think it was. Yeah, that's definitely not a bad thing to have in your CV, captain of Team GB's most successful ever side. But something I'm also interested to know is obviously, primarily in athletics, the events are all individual based but you are competing under the umbrella of Team GB. So is it still important to have a cohesive and positive team environment despite just being individual sports? Definitely. Definitely. I think you need to have a positive place to be. If, it's, if there is a negativity, if there's something that people are moaning about and complaining about, at those times, everyone's heightened, uh, emotions are heightened and people are like ready they're, they're shitting themselves if, if you're honest and anything can throw them off so like you have something negative going on it's really going to get in their head i think on that championship there was something about uh, we didn't have the flag on our kit it was um they had british athletics on it which was kind of a contentious issue it was um for me i i, I prefer to have a, a flag on the vest it was saying that, but that was my personal opinion. But I said, look, I don't care. I'm not running for them. I'm not running for British. In my team speech, I had a picture of my family. I had a wedding photo from my... As, these are the people I run for. This is my team. I got a bit emotional because obviously I was thinking about my wife and stuff and birth and all that. And it was kind of like, this is who I'm here for. So don't worry about what's going on here. Don't care about all the BS that's going on around the scenes and all the press asking you questions about it. It's just, don't worry about that. Just focus on yourself and your competition and the people that you are here for. Um so it is massively important, I think, to have a positive mindset and a positive team to be around. If you, if your roommate picks up on your negative thing as well, like we don't get rooms to ourselves, like in maybe football or whatever, but um, it can have a massive impact on what they do. If you go out, say you all finished at the start of the championships and your tr teammate is not to the end, it kind of you don't want to piss up, piss them off. You don't want to mess up their championships. This is this is the, the pinnacle of their career for that year so don't mess about with it you came off the back of that world championships you're feeling good you went to rio you won the heat and you all ran a time that would have put you in perfect position for a medal in the final then you were belatedly told that you'd been disqualified for a violation that happened in the changeover after all that hard work leading up to that moment for something like that to then happen and for your aspirations to be sort of taken away from you in an instant it must have been incredibly difficult to deal with. And I'm just wondering how you coped with that. Yeah, it was a, it was a crazy experience to like, um, like uh, we'd had a European championships already that summer. So I was kind of on a high, I won that. And then Matt had had a, a bad day in the relay there, but it, he kind of, so he already had a bit of a negative, like he was worried about the relay, very scared about the whole situation. And I, we kind of, we got him through it. He, he ran incredibly well. He made the Olympic final, ran PB in the semi-final, super fast in the final. He had an amazing game. So we were like, look, you're in a great place. You can, whatever you do, you're going to run well. And he did. Like, he did run well. But the rule was that he uh, he was adjourned to have, um, to have broken was that he steps on the line for the exchange zone. So 
in the four by four, we've got a box. It's about 20 meters long, um, wide or whatever. And he was basically bouncing on the line before he ran. And what happened was we ran, we won our heat and then we were disqualified and another team was disqualified. And um, Brazil went from being not qualified for the final, which was the last event of the games to qualifying for the final of the, Olymp of the Olympic games. And I was like, I'm perfectly honest. I said, fuck off. Like I was going through all the media and I was like, no, this is bullshit. Like they can't have that. Like they've cheated. They've cheated us out of it. And there's no video evidence. It's always done on. So like you go to other sports, it's all like, um, you have to prove your your innocent until proven guilty in athletics you're proven guilty you're guilty until proven innocent and we couldn't get any video footage of it couldn't get anything it was just a track judge's decision um so yeah i was fuming i i didn't handle myself well at all going through the mix zone uh but i felt like it was on me to like because i knew i'd done nothing wrong i was i was safe like everywhere i'm i was on it the only thing i thought like might happen is we were a pretty close at an exchange between myself and Kevin Borley. So I asked him, he was like, no, no, it was nothing to do with me. <laughs> and then we found out it was Matt afterwards. And I was like, I was fuming. I was also fuming at the BBC because they were burying us. Uh, so I went up into the studio and kind of had like, uh, I went up and defended our team and I felt like the BBC should have been backing us rather than they were on the attack really. So it was a, it was a weird experience. Yeah. I came away with a negative thing of it and, uh, it was a shame. I think uh, we had a good chance. Of, maybe, I think it's still a reach to say we could have won it in the final, We but we did run very, very well in the heat and we had probably had another second to give. So I kind of felt like first or second was there to be had. That must have been gutting knowing that you had such a good chance of, of getting a first or second and then it got snatched away and like it, it wasn't even your fault. But I guess that's part of the relay, isn't it? Mistakes like that can happen. You can see people dropping the baton all the time and it's yeah. just one of those things. But does that sort of stress you out sometimes when you're running in a relay that you you could make a mistake that's going to cost your whole team? I, I love that pressure. Like I, I was a terrible team teammate as a kid um, when I played football or rugby or whatever. If someone made a mistake, I was on them. Um, I was that annoying skinny little kid who was just ranting at everyone. So, um, but I've learned to curb that and make that kind of uh, one of my strengths in athletics. Like I kind of. I love the pressure that I'm running for my team. I'm running for my boys and, and I get the most out of myself. And it's not just my boys now. We have a mixed relay, which is an incredible thing. And I, I love that kind of responsibility that's put on my shoulders if I go last leg. Um, it's kind of a, like for Matt, like uh, he didn't, in my opinion, he didn't do anything wrong. And now the rules change that he wouldn't be DQ'd now. It'd be absolutely fine. Like uh, I thought, uh, one of the Bahrainian guys basically walked around me in Doha in 2019. So I was like, oh, cool, he's DQ'd. That's him done. We came fourth. I was like, right, go over, get him DQ'd. No. <laughs> Not how you want to win a medal, but I was like, well, we're kind of safe. Um, and then they said, no, they changed the rule after that, after that champion, after the 2016 Olympics. So um, it is. it can be scary. I think in the 4 by one it's definitely a bigger thing. Like, obviously, the changeovers are far more intricate and um, you need to be on if it's a split second too early or too late that's your medal gone so um there's definitely more in the four by one than the four by four but um i think uh, the biggest thing in the four by four is you want everyone to just commit i want them to be on it i want them to go there and be able to run 110 percent. i want them to be all the cliches that you can think of but you know i i, I want the most out of them that they can give me and um, sometimes we've had that and we won medals when we haven't won medals it's because someone maybe hasn't being able to give what they, they should be able to give. And individually, after your race as well, you obviously said that classic line of, I just ran like a dick. Yeah. And that obviously must have filled with a lot of disappointment, a lot of frustration after that race. But how uh, quickly were you able, after the games, you obviously said you didn't enjoy Rio that much. How quickly were you able to get over that frustration and disappointment moving forward? Um, well, yeah, in the games, like I, I messed up my heat. I was... I'd won the Europeans and I'd found some form going into the championships. Um, and I, I basically went into my heat too cocky. I was already thinking about my semi-final. I was already thinking about how, where I need to be in this race to make sure I get a good lane in the semi-final rather than just beat the guys. Cause I had good guys in my race. Um, and uh, yeah, I just ran way too slow down the back straight and it was completely my mistake. It was no, nothing else. My coach, my coach got me into perfect shape Um everything was set up for me to go and run well and it was my fault so that's the hardest thing in athletics I think to know that you've done everything in your power to get it right and then you mess it up on your own on the day so that's always going to take a long time for any athlete to go over 
Uh, and especially at the stage of my career where I was thinking, like, am I going to get to go to another Games? Um, am I going to be in this kind of shape ever again where I can go to Games and actually compete um, at the top level? So it was it was tough, but um, and it took me a good maybe until like 2018, 2019 before I really thought like I felt better from it. I, I We had a, a home championships in London and I had fleeting moments of, oh, this is brilliant. I loved it, but the rest of it, I hated it. Didn't like the sport anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I think that is always the danger with sport. If you are at the highest level for such a long time, you do have that burnout sometimes and you lose your love a little bit. But Mm -hmm. on the flip side, it is really positive that you have been involved in the sport for so long. You've been to three Olympic Games, which is just an incredible achievement. How do you think you've managed to stay at the highest level for so long? I just don't think I've been that good. I think, um, you know, some people like they burn the candle quick. I think I've just kind of kept it at a nice level the whole way through. Um, I've had nice peaks and been lucky uh, enough to enjoy the sport and make a good living from the sport. Um, But there's definitely, I don't know, I think it's my desire, my stubbornness and the fact that I love the sport. I love the training. I love the feeling of going through that pain barrier and just keep going. It's something I thrive on, so... Um, when I retire from this I'll probably do CrossFit and break my back or something like that but um, no I, I, it's just I think I'm stubborn I think um, I'm not willing to give up on it I'm not willing to stop until I know that I've kind of hit the end and I thought I was close to it uh, but I think this COVID uh, the the season we had off like it's the first season I've had off since I was 18 years old or well, probably younger uh, it's really helped me and I feel quite fresh now I feel like I'm instead of 33 years old I'm probably feeling like in my mid-20s so um, hopefully I can get another couple of championships out mm. With COVID it's, it seems to be something that we've found is that obviously there's been uncertainty due to COVID with Tokyo and there's people are not sure what's going to happen there but it's also seemed like a nice break for a lot of athletes and they've also almost come back a bit rejuvenated mm-hmm. Definitely yeah I feel like um in such a negative situation I've had a, a very positive experience like I've been very fortunate to spend lots of time with my wife and my kids I didn't travel for a year I, normally I spend probably two or three months away in the year maybe even more but yeah in a championship year like a big championship sometimes you're away for four weeks three, three and a half weeks so with camps and not competing or not being on flights every week in the summer it was an amazing thing to have like the time at home the time to spend and play with my kids and uh not well i'm not divorced so my wife still loves me which is nice um you spend a lot of time together we hadn't really spent uh, she was an elite athlete herself and she went to two olympics herself so we were both used to being on the road and being like um, away from home so it was nice to have that time together and uh yeah like i said i feel fresh like i, I kind of i didn't i did train but more as a support network for other people like i was helping my training partner out um partner out who was looking to have a a different summer. She was tra- challenging herself. And so I was helping her through that process. And then Guy Learmouth, who's an 800 meter runner, I was helping him with his sessions. It was more fun just to be doing that kind of stuff. And I was eating and drinking and doing all the stuff that athletes don't really get to do. I had barbecues every day. And I, after my session, there was a can in my hand kind of quickly. It was great. And then I had to lose all the weight, which has been hard work. But I've got <laughs> And it sounds like you were living the dream during lockdown. <laughs> oh, it was amazing. <laughs> like, literally, I, I can't... Um, the, the weather was perfect. Um, my kids were at an age where they both turned five and three last summer. So it was like they were having fun. Like It was the first time my kids had been sleeping properly and stuff like that, you know, like both of them. And um, yeah, we had a really good time. I think uh, it's a it's, uh, time that I will look back on fondly. Yeah, it sounds it. And now that you are back in, in training, what, what's preparation like for Tokyo? It must be weird training for something which you don't even know what, or how it's going to look when it actually comes around. I think I think my focus is actually just on myself at the moment. It's kind of like I want I've got a time I want to run. Um, it'll be enough to go to the games if the games happens. Uh, if the game doesn't happen and then that's it, then it's it. But I've still hit a time that kind of puts me, makes me feel happy and. Um, that's the aim i think it's just like i want to go if i'm going to say if i am going to retire then it'd be like right i can go out on a, on a high um i'd love to go out and say okay i'll go to tokyo and then we'll see how it goes after that. i might have to do another couple of years but like if i don't then it's kind of like cool at least i've gone there and i've a, i've uh kind of left my name in some decent much better 
uh, memories than the last couple of years where people will be like, who uh, may have only come to the sport a bit later, I won't have known what I've done before the last couple of years. So, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just excited to go out and keep training. Like, I've, I had a really good camp in Dubai. Um, I stayed away from the influencers and uh, just got some good work done. I think it was really nice just to, uh, having done a year at home, to really enjoy being away and realize how much of a privilege it is to do it. I think when I've done it so year, so many years where it was just like standard January, go South Africa. Oh, got to go to Stellenbosch. Oh, no. Um, go to Florida and Easter. Oh, no, I've got to go to the States. Oh, damn it. You know, like you kind of got spoiled by it all and it's just the norm and kind of to remember like, oh, I get to go away and be warm. Uh, it was it was a nice feeling. So uh, I really did enjoy it and uh, we'll see what happens in the next couple of weeks. Mm. It seemed like everyone was in Dubai at one point as well, even like <laughs> in that, was it the NAS sports complex? It seemed like so many yeah, yeah. elite teams were there. What was it like sort of training and just being in an environment that was just so conducive to high performance? Yeah, I'd, I'd been before. So we'd been to, we had a holding camp that before the Worlds in 2019 there. And I didn't really get to enjoy it because it was like 38 degrees during the day. And uh, like my blood boils at like 28. So <laughs> it was kind of like, I didn't really enjoy the whole experience of being in Dubai. Whereas this time it was 24 degrees. It peaked at like 26, 27. It was perfect. And the center is incredible. Like um, Prince Faz, I think it's Fazza, Faz. He's on Faz, he's Faz on uh, Instagram, but he's basically, it's his palace. And um, he's basically built like his backyard gym, which happens to be one of the best sports facilities in the world. And uh, he, it, you're there by invitation. You just don't turn up. You can't book in. You have to kind of be invited. Um, so like Virgil van Dijk's there. Khabib's there. His te- Khabib's team's there. Celtic were there when we first got there. And then one of those Moscow teams was there. It was like, I've got a friend, James Ellington, who lives in Dubai and he sometimes trains there. And it's like Cristiano Ronaldo would be on the pitch as he's doing his session. You know, it's like these are amazing things that like, uh, like I said, as a young athlete, you get excited, but I'd, I'd be excited if I saw Ronaldo. Like if I saw him, I'd be like, you're a proper athlete. I'd, yeah, I'd be like one of those fanboys. But um, <laughs> it's uh, it's an amazing centre. Uh, I'm very privileged to be this. Nad Al-Shabir, I think it's full title is. And um, yeah, it's uh, we're very lucky. Like obviously a lot of British athletes, so Emily was there. And um, uh, yeah, I think we just kind of, a couple of us really understood how lucky we were to be there. I think a couple of young guys aren't there yet, maybe because they're still, everything's so new and they just expect it to be the same way for the rest of their careers. Um, but I think once you've had it taken away from you and you remember how good it is when you go back, it was a, yeah, we just really all trained well and enjoyed the environment. No, that sounds great. And I'm very envious that you managed to get away because I haven't been away for a while. So just moving forward, what are your ambitions for after athletics? You've, you've mentioned retirement. What You've mm-hmm. obviously got a podcast, so you, maybe there's media work, but you've also talked about how you like uh, you liked your, uh, being a captain and, and coaching your training partners. So coaching could be an angle. So what, what are you thinking about when you retire? Um, I think um, for me, I definitely want to stay involved in like relay teams and management of that. I think... Uh, I've got a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge to offer there. And um, that's something that, it, whether it's enough that's going to pay, pay the bills, you know, pay the mortgage, and that's a different different question. I think, uh, I don't know, really. Like, it's one of those things that everyone says, oh, you have to have a plan. But every time I plan, I'm like, well, I might as well retire now. And I've done it. I've done it every couple of years. I'll be like, right, I need to get this set. I need to have a plan. And then all I want to do is stop because I'm like, well, I need to focus on this plan. Um, and I'm not, my mind doesn't work that way. It's literally, my mind's now split between my training, my family, and that's it. Like, that's all I have the capacity to, to really be effective at. Um, I have a small job at Loughborough College where I uh, work in the um, it's a youth talent program, which is uh, for young athletes. It's, uh, it's their first step on the British athletics pathway. And they have a course on how to be an elite athlete, basically. It doesn't tell them how to be an elite athlete. It just tells them how to survive, how to cope, like talk about finance, talk about nutrition, lifestyle, career kind of stuff. And uh, so I'm an assessor on that. And I don't think I want to be a teacher, but it's just nice to have that kind of, I use that as a bit of a easy distraction. Something that goes on my CV as well. So it's kind of good. Um, but the media stuff, I, I prefer radio perfect, rather than TV. I think you can be a bit more free and a bit more like, I suppose, off tangent. You can 
kind of carry on if you're on five live or whatever talk sport uh whereas on the bbc if you're on tv you really have to stick to the script and stay in that one minute segment or whatever so i do prefer that and i'd love to do more of that i've done a fair bit in the past and i'd love to do more stuff where you get to go and experience being in the studio and chatting about stuff that you know about rather than i'm never going to talk about football i don't know enough about football so <laughs> we'll see yeah well i think you'd be quality at it. obviously the insights you give on the podcast are pretty pretty good but um one of them that I was finding interesting was <laughs> seeing about in Zurich in 2014, you were like doing the Wolf of Wall Street, like chess yeah. thing before running out. I just want to know if there's any other stuff like that that you've seen from athletes before they go out, because they're obviously incredibly nervous and excited. Um, what have I seen other people do? I think uh, the Wolf of Wall Street thing with Harry was was an amazing memory for me. Like it's Har- Harry's someone I grew up with. Like we both went to, came from, he came from Sutton, I came from Croydon. We went through all the age group stuff together. Like he was a superstar when I was a kid, and it was like, oh, this is Harry Aikens. So to be in a, the mic, the call the call room and giving it the the whole chest bump and stuff, that was cool. Um, I the Botswana and four by four team, men and women, they they do a couple of laps before before they warm up as as part of the warm up, but they sing like um, I don't know what they are. They're like Botswana songs, but the whole team is singing it, and it's just really cool to watch them going around and like it doesn't put me off but it's cool it's a, it's a nice thing to have um a couple of guys i've had guys tell me they want to kill me and stuff before which i've always found was kind of funny um uh, like which we're literally running in a lane you can't do anything to me you can you can smash me in a race yeah no problem but like you're not going to kill me um so uh yeah you get loads of shit chat but uh my, my best i suppose my best moment as well is uh Myself and Oscar Pistorius and Kevin Borle in London 2012 before the final. We were in a little cubicle. It was like all the third and fourth leg runners are squashed in this cubicle. And there was a TV going on. It was like doing like um, kind of some weird like Pilates thing. I don't know what was on, but some weird kind of like yoga Pilates stretching session. So I get down and in the middle of the floor, I'm like, guys, this is how you do a hamstring stretch. And I start to, taking the piss. So Oscar gets down, and he starts doing another stretch. And then Kevin Borley's like, yeah, yeah. So, so you can see all these people's faces go, what the fuck's going on? What's going on? They're literally like, are, what, are we taking the piss? Are we serious? I was like, we're literally just having a laugh. The three of us got it. We got that uh, for us to be do well on the track, we had to be relaxed in that small section. And then once we got out there, we could be more more switched on, more focused. But um, those are good moments. So good things I'll always remember and, and cherish. Uh, that's fascinating. It does seem like athletes have loads of different ways of getting themselves prepared for a race. And uh, for you, it was having a joke and a laugh. Same for you, Usain Bolt. He's always messing about on the start start line. Didn't you also, um, in Beijing, didn't, didn't the whole team whistle the great escape or something? Oh, yeah. So... Um, we were in uh, 2008, way back. We were in the call room and uh, one of the guys, Andrew Steele, a uh, great human. He was my roommate in that champs and he uh, <laughs> he just starts whistling it. Like, and I was like, what the hell's he doing? Like, and then I start like thinking, I can see other people going, what's this? So I start whistling it. And um, the other two boys, they didn't really know what was going on either, to be fair to them. But <laughs> um, we were just whistling it and it was just, it was funny how people react to you. They don't know if you're being like they just don't know. Like this is an Olympics, this is huge, and you're there with whistling, whistling the the Great Escape, and they don't recognise the tune. They're probably thinking, "What's the tune from?" But <laughs> it just takes their mind off a bit. It's not like gamesmanship in the sense of uh, you're not like putting them off or anything. Because when you get out there, you're focusing on yourself anyway. But um, yeah, it was just fun. It was just, uh, it was a cool thing to have happen, and. Um, yeah, we tried to do it in 2009 as well. We, we had this long corridor from the warm-up track to the um, to the stadium. It was underground, and we literally felt like we were escaping from a prison kind of thing. So, yeah, it was. Uh, it's um, those are the memories, like I said, that you'll, you'll just cherish. You'll always remember and always enjoy and regale over lots of drink. Hopefully, in the future. Mm, I think stuff like that's quality because obviously it has the effect of potentially putting off the your opponents a little bit. But the main thing is, it's you're just about to go out onto Olympic final and you are just taking the piss and having a laugh it just shows that like enjoyment needs to be at the centre of it yeah I think I think enjoying the sport and remembering that you are lucky to do it I think that's the the thing I like we used to have um, kit carriers they have the little boxes but they don't do it in athletics anymore which I've, I, I really regret I feel like um, for me it was something that kind of this is where I started I never got to carry kits but I always wanted to, I was a little kid who loved athletics and I'd be looking up at this athlete going, oh, you're amazing. And 
so like it always reminded me like where I started my career, where I started athletics and what my, what it looked like, you know, like it, it was something that was definitely, um, I think we've lost in athletics because it's the connection between the youth and the, the elite. And, um, yeah, those moments like, yeah, when I get on the start line, I'm, I'm focused, uh, everything's on, but I can't be the person who's, if I'm warming up and I'm super serious and then I go to quarter and I'm super serious, I'll just be knackered. And, um, I know a lot of people who've messed up championships and messed up events by literally for like weeks on end, just thinking about one thing in their mind and you can't do it. You have to have, you have to be relaxed. You have to kind of go in there. I think you see it in more like sports, like fighting sports where if someone's tense, they're never going to win that fight. I think it was Conor McGregor. Like his stance was tense in that last fight with Poirier, like Poirier beat him. But like if he, when he's more relaxed, you can see he's more relaxed and he's throwing punches differently and, he wins fights, whereas if he's tense, and it's the same for me, if I'm tense, I can't compete. Thanks so much for uh, for doing that and giving up your time. Really enjoyed that. Cam, Joel, that was really good. Uh, thank you very much for your time. There's some good questions in there, so I really enjoyed that. Oh, I really appreciate that, Martin. And cool. Best of luck all right, with, with all your Tokyo yeah, training. Right. Cheers, boys. Bye-bye. That was a chat I really enjoyed. I loved hearing about his approach to pressurised situations and there is no environment that is more pressurised than Olympic Games and obviously he's been to three of them. I feel he's someone who's really good at putting things in perspective in such a positive way as well. He was saying that he knows he's privileged to do athletics for a living and so he tried to let go of the things that didn't go his way and then more recently in lockdown, he's enjoyed spending time with his family and it's allowed him to feel really revitalised going forward. Overall, I just rate his honesty. He's a funny guy who's honest about areas like the future of athletics and anti-doping, and it's really nice to hear from a modern athlete. I really enjoyed chatting to Martin today and hearing about his journey because, like he said, often the only glimpse of athletes you get is a two-minute interview at the end of a match or at the end of a race, so it's always nice to hear their stories in such detail like that. And his story is such an interesting one. He's had so many highs like world championship and Olympic medals, but he was also so honest about lows like disqualification at Rio 2016 and underperforming at London 2012. I was also really interested in his insights about pressure too and how he found the crowd screaming his name at London 2012 just too much to handle. I've always assumed that athletes enjoy having their name chanted, but for Martin, it actually made focusing on the task in hand more difficult. London 2012 itself though it wasn't all bad for him and I loved hearing about his night out with Usain Bolt and I can't really think of many other athletes you'd rather have a night out with than Usain. If you enjoyed this episode definitely check out Martin's own podcast which is called That Greaves and Rooney Sports Podcast and leave us a rating on Apple or Spotify.